The KV-1 was a successful heavy tank fielded by the Red Army in 1940. This behemoth posed a major threat to the Wehrmacht, and despite some technical flaws, like an overstressed transmission, went on to be one of the most successful Russian tanks of World War II, overshadowed only by the T-34. Hi, I'm James from LPJ Models, and in this video I'm going to be building the Tamiya 135th KV-1 1941 early, as voted for by you. As usual, before we get stuck into the build, we'll be taking a quick look inside the box. The instructions are the usual Tamiya affair, they're clear, concise and easy to follow. What more can you want with some instructions? There are two paint schemes included in this kit, both in 4BO green. There's also a small 120th, if you're in 135th scale, paper model of the KV-1 included. The decals are nicely printed and the Zas Stalina slogan will look nice on the side of the turret. The clear sprue is small but well formed, with a pair of goggles and the headlight being the only items on this sprue. You also get a selection of small polycaps, and some larger polycaps. You also get a piece of string for the tow cable. Nice try Tamiya, but no thanks. The body of the tank is nicely detailed with hex bolts, rivets and panel lines. It would have been nice to have the option for photo etch air intakes. Unfortunately that's not the case, but for this build they'll do. One area where Tamiya have knocked this one out of the park is the surface texture on the turret. The armour texture is nice and subtle and it's going to look great under a layer of paint. Tamiya have also included a very nicely sculpted commander figure, and it's great to see this effort on Tamiya's part. The less said about their older figures, the better. This is the first up-to-date new tool Tamiya kit I've seen, and the details are really nice. Tracks can always be a bit tedious, but luckily these ones are link and length, so they should be quick to build. They also look nicely moulded. When you turn them over however, there are a few ejector pin marks, but these won't be difficult to clean up. Right, with that out of the way, let's get building. The parts were carefully removed from the sprues with my new god hand nippers. I got these for Christmas. Thanks Soph. These sprue cutters are expensive, but they do give a really clean cut, making the build a bit more streamlined. The hull is made up of several parts. This construction is made easy by a spacer provided. Before you get gluing, there are a few holes that need drilling, so watch out for these. I drilled these out with a 0.8mm drill bit and cleaned up the mess with a scalpel. Any mess left after removing items from the sprue were cleaned up with an Infini Model 800 grit sanding stick. These Infini sanding sticks are a new addition to the workbench, and I gotta say, they're really good. The front plate fitted on with some clever engineering, meaning it lined up perfectly. On this build I wanted to show one of the fenders being partially removed, so to do this I had to remove some of the fixtures and fittings on the tank. The front mounting bracket was carefully cut away with a fresh scalpel. This was then sanded smooth and the mounting hole was filled with milliput. I also had to remove one of the mounting brackets on the side of the tank. I first cut away the bolt heads and then drilled them out with a 0.3mm drill bit. This made sure the mounting holes were in the right place when I removed the rest of the part. The mounting slot for the front fender half was filled with milliput. This would have been better with some sheet styrene, but I didn't have any to hand. The next step was to remove the front section of the fender. The fenders on the real KV are split up into three separate sections, 
You can find these by looking out for the double row of bolts. So this is going to represent a fender that's been damaged and then removed by the crew. And to make this look more realistic and believable, I drilled out some of the bolt holes. The trickiest part of modifying the fenders was removing this ridge line. It's not present on the real tank and just supports the plastic fenders on the model. Once the modifications were complete, the whole area needed a tidy up. I scraped away some excess plastic with a number 11 scalpel blade and then sanded it smooth. Following on with the kit instructions, it was time to tackle the running gear. This was fairly straightforward, and the only thing that was slightly annoying was some mold seams on the bogey wheels. You get this with most tanks though. No big drama, a bit of sanding and they're sorted. The suspension arms have a pin that hold them in place, so if you want to use aftermarket tracks and have these poseable, you'll have to remove it. And whilst we're on the subject of tracks, the kit tracks were really easy to assemble. I mean, after removing them from the sprues and cleaning them up, I think it took about 15 minutes to do each side. The individual track link sections were assembled, and whilst the glue was still wet, these were wrapped around the drive sprocket and the idler wheel. The track sections were glued very carefully so I could remove it all later for painting. The weld seams on the turret ring protector were just blobs of plastic, so these needed to be redefined. I used VMS styrene cement fast and a scalpel blade to sculpt in some weld beads. The fender support brackets were glued onto the fenders, but the fenders were left separate from the model to make painting easier. I'm going to add some battle damage to this build, and that's something I've not done before. I decided to follow Night Shift's awesome bullet holes tutorial to add some bullet holes to my storage boxes. The plastic was thinned with a generic Dremel tool, and the bullet holes were pierced with an old airbrush needle. Adding to the battle damage, I wanted to show the front headlamp without the glass. I drilled out a hole in the centre of the lamp and put in some lead wire to simulate broken wires. I'm going to add some shell impact soon, but before I do that, I need to assemble the turret. In a similar fashion to the hull tub, this was built up of several sections. The parts underneath and to the rear of the turret fit surprisingly nicely. I had kind of expected to use a bit of putty here, but luckily none was needed. The turret gun has movable elevation and this is where some of the polycaps come in. 
The one piece barrel was surprisingly nice. It required minimal cleanup and fit perfectly. As you probably guessed from a hint I made earlier, I'm going to replace the rather lacklustre Tamiya tow cable. I bought some brass picture wire specifically for this reason. While it might not be as malleable as the string, it definitely looks a lot better. This was literally a drop-in replacement. It fit into the tow hoops with no modification needed. And now it's time for the scary bit, shell impacts. While I was apprehensive about drilling into my model, I followed the night shift tutorial and it was actually quite easy. I drilled in a guide hole with a fine drill bit and widened this with a larger 2.5mm drill bit. Next up, the hole was cleaned with VMS styrene cement fast. The shell holes were then filled with AK grey putty. This was then pressed with a toothpick to make it look more dented. Whilst I was feeling in a destructive mood, I added some glancing blows to some of the armour with a Dremel attachment. I kept these really subtle, I only did one or two and kept them fairly small. And that's it for the build. Including the modifications, it took me two days to complete. It was an absolute breeze. So let's get this disassembled and get some paint on it. I scoured the internet for days, looking for a KV with a colour scheme that wasn't just green. I did find one that ended up looking really cool, so what you're going to see is my interpretation of that camouflage scheme. So first up, the whole model was primed with Mr Surfacer 1500 thinned with Mr Leveling Thinners. I forgot how smoothly this stuff sprayed. It's great, and it'll give me a great base for painting on. For the first camouflage layer, I used AK Real Colour 4BO. And before you say, what? No black basing? I'm going to try something a little different this time round. Black basing works great for soft edge camo schemes, but as this is a hard edge, it just doesn't quite fit the bill. So I've decided to go for a base coat, then some post shading, and then some blended highlights. The Forbio Green was then 70% thinner to 30% paint. This was then built up in light layers. I've been working hard on my spray discipline and trying to make sure my coats are even and smooth. Quite often I get bits of dust in my paint finish, but using lacquers tends to alleviate that because they dry so quickly. When I finished with the green, I made some sausages out of white tack. It's pretty much the same as blue tack, just white, and it's not quite as greasy. Anyway, I used these white tack sausages to mark out my camouflage lines. This technique is something I've only dabbled with once or twice, so hopefully it comes out okay. I then used AK Real Colour 6K Dark Brown, thin 7030 with Mr Leveling Thinners, and infilled the sausages. It's important to maintain a constant angle when spraying this to make sure you get nice crisp lines. Once the camo was done, and it came out pretty well, I used a mix of AK Real Colour Black and MRP Rot Brown, heavily thinned with Mr Leveling Thinners, about 90% thinners to 10% paint, and then post shaded around all the details 
In some areas I went really heavy with the application, but in others I was quite light, just to add some variation to the overall finish. Now I know you're probably thinking, James that post shading looks a bit strong, but the effect will get reduced in subsequent layers. Ok on to the highlights, I'm first highlighting the brown with a mix of 7k sand and dunkel brown heavily thinned with MLT. This will add some highlights, some extra tonal variation and blend in some of that post shading. This layer will also soften some of the hard edge camouflage, making the camo look worn and less regimented. I used MRP Olive Green to highlight the 4BO Green. I thought the AK 4BO Green looked quite dull, so whilst this acts as a highlight, it will also add some more life to the green. Once the highlights were complete, it was time to spray on the markings. There's some debate as to whether this was a Cyrillic G or a number 7, because it's not sure whether the original photo was flipped or not, so I've gone for a 7. I mixed up an off-white colour with MRP Clear Doped Linen 1 and white. This was thinned with MLT and then carefully sprayed over my high-tech homemade mask. Next up it was time to add some more tonal variation by painting some of the small details in different shades of greens and browns. This stage can help break up the monotony of the finish further and add lots of visual interest. I decided to mask and spray the areas where the fender mounting points were with MRP Hull Red. Now I know the Soviets didn't use a red primer, this is purely artistic license on my part. Next up is the chipping. I mixed a light green colour out of Vallejo Green Grey, Golden Olive, Flat Green and Russian Uniform World War II. This was mixed up to a green that's similar but lighter than the base colour. I loaded up a coarse filter sponge with some of the paint mix and dabbed away some of the excess on a paper towel. This sponge is great because it's non-porous and you can also get some really fine chips with it. The whole model was then chipped with this mix using the sponge technique. Next up, I filled in the larger green chips with smaller chips using VMS Chip & Nick CN01. This is a deep red-brown colour and makes a brilliant dark rusty steel colour this was carefully painted in the middle of some of the larger green chips. This gives you a really nice two-tone, layered chipping effect. 
I used the same two chipping colours to add damage around the shell impacts. The VMS Chippenick was used once again to show deeper surface wear in bare metal. This will be weathered more later. As the bogey wheels were steel, I needed to show worn metal on them. I used Mr. Metal Colour Stainless, a buffable metallic paint, to simulate this. With most of the paintwork complete, it was time to move on to weathering. But before I got stuck in with that, I sealed in the entire model with a good layer of VMS satin varnish. This was sprayed unthinned at around 25 psi in wet coats. Once the varnish had dried, I coated the entire model in MIG Scratches effects. This is a water soluble chipping layer like hairspray, and I'm using this because I want to try out some dust effects. Over the chipping fluid, I sprayed a very light, heavily thin layer of AK Real Colour Dunkel Gelb. When the dust layer had dried, I used water and an old brush to remove some of it. This will hopefully give it a natural, varied appearance. This is a technique I've previously been a bit too chicken to do, but hopefully the reward will outweigh the risks. This technique was also repeated on the upper hull in areas where dust was most likely to accumulate. Now I don't know about you, but I think this technique looks really effective, and it'll look even better when I put some dust and earth effects over the top later. And next up is the trusty old pin wash. And this time I'm going to go for something slightly different. So usually I'd use my own custom mix of French Ultramarine and Burnt Umber Artist Oils. But this time, to mix it up a bit, I'm using Abtarling 502 Sepia mixed with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier. <laughs> 
The sepia wash was applied around details and in the recesses around the model, and any excess wash was cleaned up with a brush dipped in thinner. Before I moved on with further oil layers, I sealed the model in with a layer of VMS matte varnish. This will give the oil paint something to grip to. Before I moved on with further weathering, I painted the tracks. I mixed up a grimy medium grey out of AK Real Colour, Dark Grey and Dunkelgelb. This mixture was sprayed on the tracks from every angle to make sure it was completely covered. When these were dry, I sprayed Alclad Magnesium over the contact areas of the tracks. This was then protected with a layer of masking tape and the original track colour was sprayed over. And I know, I did this the wrong way round, but I got there in the end. The tape was then peeled away, revealing the metal sections of the tracks. To show some worn areas on the tracks, I used Mr Metal Colour Stainless again and buffed this in with a cotton bud. Some more depth was then added to the tracks with MIG Ammo Tracks Wash mixed with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier. Whilst the tracks were drying, I added some light soot staining around the shell impacts with Abtal and Sepia thinned with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier. This was then blended in with a brush lightly moistened in thinner. To simulate some minor corrosion, the inside areas of the shell impacts were painted with Migamo Light Rust Wash. I also added some rust staining to a few of the paint chips. This was painted carefully over the chips and then blended with thinner. On the lower areas of the hull and running gear, I speckled on some MIG Ammo Dry Step Splashes. This product has some light texture to it and looks really convincing. The dry step splashes was then thinned with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier. This was then painted over the tracks and the running gear. To add a bit more visual interest to the side of the tank, I posed one of the pistol ports open. Now this was usually attached with a chain, but as I didn't have one fine enough, I just used a piece of wire. The hull and turret MGs were painted with Mr. Metal Colour Dark Iron. This was then buffed with a cotton bud to give it a nice metallic sheen. The exhausts were painted and textured by speckling on various MIG ammo rust effects 
When these were dry, they were sealed in with VMS matte varnish and glued carefully onto the model. I noticed the mud was looking a bit stark, so to blend it in better, I washed over some Abtiling 502 sepia. Before I get onto the final layers, dust, wet effects and speckling, I sealed in the whole model with a layer of VMS matte varnish. This will unify and protect the previous layers. First up, let's make this engine deck look a bit more grimy. I speckled and brushed on Abtiling 502 engine grease. This should make it look suitably filthy. It also dries with a gloss finish. Next up, I mix some MIG Ammo Dry Step with Burnt Umber Oil and VMS Universal Weathering Carrier. This was brushed carefully over the previously painted dust effects to add more texture. I added some Burnt Umber to this mix because the Dry Step on its own dries really light and the Burnt Umber adds a bit more warmth and depth to the colour. Any areas that looked too linear were blended in with thinner. I added some exhaust staining with black and MRP red-brown, heavily thinned with Mr. Leveling thinners. This was sprayed at around 10 psi using reference pictures as a guide. To add a final layer of variation to the finish, I speckled Abtiling 502 Sepia, heavily thinned with Universal Weathering Carrier. Some greasy wet patches were then added to the running gear with Abtiling 502 Engine Grease, heavily thinned with Universal Weathering Carrier. And with that, the build was complete. So, how do you think I got on with my 135th Tamiya KV-1 build? Let me know in the comments below. Also, don't forget to hit that like button, and if you want to see more videos like this in the future, hit that subscribe button. And before I go, I want to give a huge thanks to these guys, my patrons, for supporting my work. You folks are awesome and your support is much appreciated. If you're interested in becoming a patron, Click on the card in the corner or the link in the description. And now all that's left are the final gallery images. I'm James from LPJ Models. Thanks for watching.